But again, to your listeners, um, if you're on the video version of this, then you can already see. If you're not, then I'm going to tell you who we're with. We're with somebody who I'm um, privileged to call a friend, and he's got the freedom and he knows it to deny that during the podcast. So this is more than a guest. A guest um, who, when we first met, um, encouraged me to go and tell a Champions League winner that he had a fat arse. That's how good friendships really truly begin. We're with Joachim, Jockey, Jockey Bjorklund. Uh, Jockey, first of all, good evening. Thank you for joining us. Good evening, good to be here. Good evening. What a gentleman that is. Jockey, um, I've saved, uh, we've never done um, a true false round to begin any of the big interviews before. But this is not long answers. This this is true false. And, and I'd only ask you, no lying, because you've got a devilish sense of humour. So, here we go, Jockey. Are you ready? This is true false. Jockey, you could easily name, as a footballing Swede, your all time cricketing 11, taking in all major cricket, cricket countries and eras. True or false? Uh, true, for sure. Jockey Brooklyn, even though only 12 and not in possession of Wellington boots or a Macintosh, you were sitting in the pouring rain of the European Cup Winners Cup final in 1983 in the Ulevi Stadium in Gothenburg, cheering on the mighty dandies. True or false? True, with my granddad. Jockey, your father played for your uncle at Usters and very nearly knocked out the European champions in season 1979-80. I wouldn't call it very nearly, but uh, he played them. He played them. Yeah. Everything sure. else is true. Yeah. Everything We're taking it. Yeah. We're taking it. Yeah. Joachim Bjorkman, you played international football for your country at the camp now. No, oh, that's false. International football for my country? Yes. Uh, no, 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 I did that. Oh, oh I did. Yeah, I did. <laughs> Olympics. Okay. That's we'll come back to it. Yeah, so yeah, we're yeah. agreeing now that it's true. It's true. Um, uh, Jockey Bjorkland, like Wes Brown of Manchester United, secrets galore now, you are partial to a little bit of sluice. Uh, that's probably true, yeah. But I'm a Swede, I got an excuse. Okay. Jockey Bjorkov, you twice helped your club reach the Champions League final. Mm, yeah, partly true. Didn't participate much in the last season, no, but yeah. Fully well, true. I'll take that. It sounds good. I'll take that. Mr. Jockey Bjorkov, you were within one win of reaching the World Cup final and within two wins of an Olympic gold medal. Uh, true on the first one for sure, and I'd say three wins, Olympic gold medal, right? Because we lost in that the quarterfinals. Yeah, that yeah. was the only false one in this one. Yeah, that's the false really one. Good. Yeah. Really good. Really good effort. Last two, you currently coach a team where a splendid young Iraqi midfielder is named after an Argentinian teammate of yours. That's true, though he's Swedish, but yeah. The last one, and I've, I've already hinted at this. You once, you dirty bastard, you once told me to tell Patrick Anderson that he, that he had a fat arse, and Patrick was deeply unimpressed. True, but I mean, in the end, we measured. He had the biggest arse in the Swedish national team. We did a few measurements, and it's true. <laughs> who, who, did, who did the measurement? You weren't out there with a tape measure, were you? Tell no, me no, why. I wasn't. He's a friend of mine. <laughs> <laughs> you understand? All right, let, let, let's, let's go all the way back because you are genuinely, and, and thanks for the fun, you are part of a dynasty. Like you said, your granddad was the president of Gothenburg. Your uncle was a talented coach who coached the national team. Your dad was a talented footballer and eventually a, a talented coach. Um, and now we already know that your boys play football and Cal is playing for you at Hammerby. Let's go back to Osters and explain what I mentioned about your dad playing against the European champions because that must have been a gigantic occasion. Nottingham Forest had beaten a Swedish team to win the European Cup 
and in the first round of the next season, they come to town. Yeah. Uh, in retrospect, uh, obviously a shame to get the uh, reigning champions in the first round, but uh, Öster, my local team, where my the, the granddad was the president for uh, 46 or 48 years, uh, won the league uh, and got drawn against Nottingham, Nottingham Forest, with Peter Shilton, Viv Anderson, Larry Lloyd, etc. And that's actually my first trip abroad. Uh, it's 80, I think. And the whole family went to England to watch the game, to Nottingham, to the city ground. Uh, so I remember the, the game pretty well. And you say it was close, but I think in the two games, it wasn't even that close. But there you go. Good experience. But what, I mean, Francis. I mean, literally, what was the atmosphere like? Because if I'm not wrong, I think... Just a Tony Woodcock goal in one of the matches makes a difference. And you pointed out that, you know, it was full of elite footballers. John Robertson, like I mentioned, Woodcock. John McGovern from, you know, an Aberdonian lad. Uh, we're getting Scottish, right? Uh, listen, baby, there's going to be so much of this. You have no idea how much you're going to get of this. We're going to talk about Ilya Kiryakov in the World Cup. Man, it's just going to come at you. Also, the World Cup, the Olympic medal was denied to you by Australia. You didn't know that he, they were coached by Aberdeen centre half, Eddie Thompson. So don't open Pandora's box. It's oh, going to no, be no. Aberdeen okay. all the way. And by the way, I enjoyed my, my years in Scotland as well. So no worries. It's, seriously, what, what does it do to a relatively small town when they draw the champions? And, and what, was the, what was it like for your father at that stage? Because he was one of the team stars. And you're on the spot, right? Probably a good thing for him, but uh, then again, uh, in those days, for uh, younger watchers or listeners, uh, it wasn't like Champions League. You had one head-to-head -head meeting, uh, and then you were either in or out, and, and to get drawn against the Champions in the first game, it's a little bit of an unluck, I'd say. Uh, and the year after, they go, got by Munich in the first round as well, which wasn't much uh, better, but, you know, Great experience uh, playing at, against uh, some of the best players in the world, reigning champions, uh, and I'm sure he enjoyed it. But he would have enjoyed more to get a couple of easy draws and uh, advance, I think, to be honest. And, you, and, and history's repeating itself at the moment because your boy Kala is a centre half for Hammerby. But you, I, if I'm not wrong, you end up playing for your dad quite early in your career, right, as coach? Yeah, I even played with my dad as a player when he, when he played. Uh, my last season was his, my first season was his last season. In, now we're talking Oster again and we played together for five or six games in, in the top division of Sweden. And uh, then a few years later, I'm, I had him as a coach. And uh, for me, it, it was a good experience. It was a good experience. I was there before him. He came after me, so it wasn't like uh, any talk about nepotism or what have you. And I enjoyed it. He, he was a good coach, and I, he, he still is. And most of everything is still, is still my dad. And now I'm in the same situation, which, to be honest, from a coach's point of view, is a bit tricky at the time because uh, you have to divide it. You're either a father or you're a coach, and uh, you can't have it both. So we've decided that privately, I'm his dad, and at work, I'm his coach, and that's the way it works. And it gets a little bit harder for him to get in the team, but that's that's part of it, isn't it? What, what did, how did you and your dad speak about it? Because when he coached you, I think it's at Bran, right, in Bergen? Yeah, yeah, right. And, and but so you know the modern way is to talk and to share. But maybe some years ago, football wasn't quite so keen on that. So how did you and Carl Kalla, your dad, after whom your son's name, how did you work that one out? Nah, he just told me to play better, and that was it. And I said <laughs> yes, <yeah. laughs> and I said yes, coach, or yes, dad, depending on the environment. Uh, no, it was different at that time, but. Uh, 
fortunately enough, I had uh, a season before in the in the first team, top tier in Norwegian football, and uh, not to be boasting, but uh, I think I was the best player the year before he came, so it wasn't really a problem, to be honest. But you used the N word there. Um... Right, and deliberately, because uh, I wasn't going to raise it, but you must have been, I imagine, man, I didn't know you back then, but I imagine that because you're really explosive here, uh, and, and it's an ex this is the first of the places that I, I want to stop, and I, I'd like you to put yourself back in that mindset, because you've done so well, uh, both at Oster's and at Brand, that when, after the 90 World Cup, um, two players, uh, it's when the same stops, who, who largely is that you're slightly different footballers, but you're in the same position. And one other, I think a, a Larson, I don't know. Yeah, Peter Larson. Peter Larson stops. Yeah. So there are gaps, and, and your form is so good that you're going you're gonna to push your way through. But the end word is nepotism. And I, I, I didn't see it because I've seen you playing subsequently, so I know why you were picked. But it felt like you maybe had to address that because as you make the breakthrough in the national team, Tommy is your uncle. And yeah. it's clear that he picks you on quality and performance, but what have you had to bite back or fight back against that kind of shit being asked of you in the past? Not really. Uh, obviously, a few headlines first time he picked me, but uh, then again, we're talking about football and uh, everything uh, falls to place, I'd say. I mean, either you're good enough and then you play, or uh, you're not good enough and you're not going to play. It's not like if you have a big company where you have a thousand employees, uh, maybe you can hide away like uh, a son or a wife or a cousin or whatever. But in football, you, you, sort of, you, you get a receipt every week on the field uh, if you're performing or not. And if I wouldn't have, I would have been out of the team and that's it. So I didn't think much of it, uh, to be honest. Uh, I had, uh, hard enough time to focus about the, the teams who are going to play in, in the Euros, 92. Uh, well, but, but you say that, but it wasn't just the Euros, because I, my memory might be playing with me, but I think I remember you being so kind to us in 92, knocking Scotland out of the Under-21 Championships. So my memory is, plus some research, is that this, this explosive young kid who's been playing football outside Sweden, gets brought in in a year where you play the under-21 championships, and although you end up injured, Sweden reached the final against Italy, against Cesare Malbini's Italy, Italy, Paolo's dad, another dynasty. You, you then, and we'll stop off at these, you then play the Euros at home, where Sweden are hosts, you beat Denmark, and the fuckers go on and win it, you beat England, which is a massive result for a country that's kind of obsessed over your childhood years of watching the first division, the Premier League, you play four friendlies and you play the Olympics where you come within, as you said, three matches of a gold medal. 92, you know, as much as you, you, you're you quite a, a laid-back, down-playing guy, 92 is, is a fucking astonishing year for you. A good year. My oldest son's born 92 as well. So bring that into the mix. Uh, in retrospect, it's a good year. It's a good year and went uh, really fast. Really fast. Uh, I've gone through the ranks. I played in the under 17s, under 19s, under 21s, what have you, for Sweden. But uh, the call up for, for the full international team was a little bit of a surprise. But as you said, I was lucky enough to be in a position where two really good players quit after, after the World Cup 90. Uh, if they would have stayed on and they could have for another four or five years, maybe another one would have gotten an opportunity. But then again, if you're given the opportunity, you have to take it. And uh, I suppose, uh, I suppose I did. Though I started playing a left back for Sweden. Not like Roberto Carlos, but similar. J Jockey Carlos. Um, yeah. Do you remember much about um... Because with the Aberdeen theme, I could name you know Scott Booth and Ian Jess and Stephen Wright and Michael Watt and goals, uh, and you sneak past us by a single goal. Thanks. But the, the Dutch, now a bit more serious, the Dutch team that you play against has De Boers and Ophemars and a number of players 
who go on to do big things for their clubs and international team, but less so maybe than the Boers and Overmars. It's a very good side that you play against. And you, you knock out, you knock out Holland in the first chunk of that 92 footballing experience. Can you remember that experience? Can you remember? Yeah, I do. I do. I remember well. Uh, you forgot about the best Scottish players, though. Duncan Ferguson. Big Duncan was up against yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, Big Duncan yeah. was in that team as well. Was no, he the reason you went off injured? Huh? Was he the He's reason you went off? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Big surprise. <laughs> It was, a, it was a good percentage bet, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I don't hold it against him. Uh, no, but it was a, a, up to that stage, the Holland game, as you spoke about, which was the final qualifier for the Olympics, was probably the best, uh, the biggest game I played in my life up, up until then. We lost 2 1 away, and by, I don't know, luck. Great determination, what have you, a little bit of skill as well. We beat them one nil at home and then we qualified for Europe. Uh, no, for, for the Olympics, sorry. For the Olympics? For the Olympics and uh, then we played Scotland in the semi-finals. Yeah. In Örebro, like yeah. a small town in the middle of nowhere in Sweden. We played Scotland. I got in here in the first game. Could have... Could have played in Scotland, but I was injured. But then when the final was, uh, we played Italy. Uh, we had our supposedly three best players away. Me, Patrick and uh, Thomas Brolin were with a full international team preparing for the, for the Euros. And I think, and I believe still, if we would have been in the team, we would have beaten Italy as well. We would have been under 21 uh, European champion. Champions. But who did you play against for Holland? Who was your? So, uh, sorry, that's a bad question. Uh, uh, under twenty one level, were you still playing centrally or at full back? Oh no, centrally, centrally, centrally. I only had like uh, three games in my life as a, as a left full back, and I was my three first Euro England, ninety two games. England, Denmark, and France. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's the only ones, and please never again. Uh, <laughs> we played the the. the the striker in Holland at the time was Eric Myers. Decent career, but not, not one of the not one of the famous famous Dutch players. But as you said, that the Boer brothers, uh, Overmars, Reggie Blinke, who played uh, somewhere in Scotland, I think. Yeah, I've heard of wrong Ooh. side of town now. An Eric Wilson's challenge. They had a good team. Uh, <laughs> Newman, Newman played. He played. Arthur right, Newman. Uh, right side yeah, we're, we're gonna. Yeah, yeah but we're gonna come up. That team as well. Yeah. We're gonna come up against your next uh, adventure against Arthur to, Arthur Newman in just a minute, eh? Because yeah. these are big results. Um, who was quicker, you or Overmars? Even though you weren't directly, you were you were athletically very very quick. Were you as quick as Overmars? If we're talking about raw speed, yeah, for sure. But no, uh, don't bring skills and uh, that into the mix. That, that, that's a whole different story, right? But it's terrible. Speed, every, yeah. time, every time we talk about this, that's what you say. It's, yeah, I don't yeah. like this. We're talking about quicker. Yes, yes, yes. I've met one player in my whole life, as I can remember, who... who Match me or probably even beat me at raw speed, and that was uh, Tony Daly, Euro '92. Who we're talking about together. He was quick. Aston Villa playing yeah. for England, yeah. Yeah. and you're directly against him, right? Yeah, I was directly against him, and uh, good, the good thing about him, and he he might be the only player I played against who was quicker than me. But he had uh, more or less the same skill set as me as well, so it worked out fine <laughs> in the end. I've got bad news for you. Tony's a regular listener to the podcast. Yeah, good, set. good. If, no, no. If, if, you don't want to adapt that. Okay, okay. In okay. my world, that's a big compliment. He, he was... world, that's a big compliment. <laughs> Quickest player I've ever, ever met, right? Right. Yeah, we only hear the good part. So. Let's, you get taken away from an under-21 side, which if you look at the results, because the, the final against a good Italy side, 
uh, which will go on and retain their under-21 crown in yeah. Spain in the next tournament, um, playing against Spain in the final. It's a couple of years later, but it's against the Raul and De La Peña and Oscar Garcia and so on and so forth. When you get taken away from that side to prepare, obviously the thrill is big. But what was the country like when you ho- when a country like Sweden hosts a tournament like Euro '92? What was the buzz, the pressure? Did people take it calmly? Because you, you'll remember, for example, the only ten European championships have been the British Isles at Euro '96. It yeah. was in England, and, and everybody went absolutely crazy. It's the summer of love, great music. England made it to the semi-finals of Sweden, did it? What was the feeling like? What was the buzz like? Did, did Sweden take it really like a fiesta? Yeah, they did. And uh, it was the first time we, we were in the proper Euros as well. Because uh, you remember, because uh, you're more or less my age, right? Uh, how it used to be. How it used to be. It, it wasn't like 24 teams back then, like it is now. It, it was eight teams competing in two groups and to qualify for Euros were for a small country like Sweden, nearly impossible. And, and we didn't, we got in as a host, which is very unlikely to happen again uh, due to the stadiums we have here in Sweden. Uh, but it was the first time Sweden played in the Euros, uh, in the proper Euros. And it was a buzz, we had a new team coming into the tournament. Uh, underdogs for sure, we had England and France in our group and Denmark who got in there in the last second. Uh, but it was a bus, but as I said before, I I had uh, enough on concentrating on, on on my own performance to be honest to more than enjoying like the bus around. Who who um who was your direct opponent for France? Papa, Jean Pierre. Not bad. Decent Not player. Bad. Yeah. And if he wasn't, and if he wasn't there, Cantona rolled out on that uh, on that side. So yeah, two half decent players, I'd say. Uh, but when when you think about that exact match, I think ends in a draw. It, it, it's probably if you had to win two games. Am I, did I exaggerate the de- degree to which growing up the Nordic countries were obsessed with England? And, and, and there was a little bit, of, I can't remember exactly why, but there's a little bit of bad blood also um, that built up over the years between Sweden and England. I particularly remember immediately after World Cup 98, it was an outright battle um, in the National st- um, Stadium in Stockholm. But, but your win, I'm absolutely sure, must have felt like maybe when Scotland beat England, because th- there was this obsession with growing up watching BBC, First Division football, Swedes all over your country support Liverpool or United or Leeds or Arsenal. I don't care who it is. That must have felt like a, a like a, a mini final for you. It was, and especially due to the circumstances, it was the last game in the group stages. We knew if we win the game, we were in the semi-finals, and England are out, and that that brings another level to it as well. But you know. And I think it's the history between England and Sweden as well. At that time, I don't think, uh, and that, that kept on for quite a long time. I don't think England beat Sweden in 40 odd years for some reason. You could lose against everybody else, but against England, I think I played them five times, never lost. And that kept on for a while as well. And, and it, was, it was a big thing. Playing England, everybody, the only international football we can watch in Sweden when I was young was the English, or uh, well, not Premier League, but first of all, whatever you call it, the highest tier of English football. That's the only thing we could watch, and maybe a couple of European Cup finals. So it was a big thing to win against England. I must say, though, England 92, that's not the best side they ever put out, to be honest. No disrespect to anyone. No, the, the purpose of this conversation is to be um, honest, I'm never abusive, but honest. And it, it was a difficult time for me. I, I mean, I haven't done this research, but my memory tells me that that was Taylor took Lineker off, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, yeah, in his last game, last competitive last game, game for England, yeah. Is, is that as a, as a defender? I'm okay, at that stage, 
you're still left back. So I don't think you move to centre half until the Germany game, I think. But you see Lineker going off. Do you kind of go tick a box and go, okay, that definitely is one less threat? It is. It is. They brought on uh, Alan Smith, a very good player as well, who played uh, at Arsenal at the time. But uh, any time they take out England's top scorer ever, as it was at the time, it, it's it's a relief, isn't it? And uh, it's uh, in looking back at it, it's nice to have played Gary Lineker the last time he played against uh, he played for England. And one, did this help us a little bit because I, I, I'm not quite sure why Thomas Brolin has become a creature of mythology because there are many footballers who've been a little bit eccentric, who've gained a little bit of weight, uh, who've got talent and that, that describes some of the parts of him. But for some reason, everybody over about five, six years around Europe went crazy about him. He was like, this is the only guy who's ever behaved like this. Describe him. Tell us about him. Oh, but as a Swede, it's, uh, it's easy because we, uh, we had great success in the Euros, as we talked about. 92 went to semi-finals and then uh, two years after, uh, same again in the World Cup, went to the semi-finals. And in those two tournaments, he was by far, I'd say, our best player. So that's that's his status in Swedish football and then he quit after a pretty serious injury at 28 so nearly he could have been a rock star if he would have died at 27 but it's uh, it's close to isn't it close by I, I like the Jimi Hendrix Mama Cass Elliot Janis Joplin reference but I think people thought he well, I think he thought he was a rock star and that's what I'm fishing for have we got him wrong what was he like as a guy Really good guy, still a really good friend of mine, which I see a lot more of now uh, than I'm in Sweden after 25 years than I have before. Good guy, humble guy, and for Sweden for a few years, probably our best play in modern time, uh, except for except for the big one, the, the tall one. Him. Yeah, the tall we'll one. Yeah. Yeah. And and Patrick, no, it, it's not you this time. Sorry. It, it's no, not, no, 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 it's not you. Yeah. We're talking about Adam Ackermans. Well, you We're said the big one. That's, 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 oh, I'm just going. Yeah, yeah. I'm in, I'm in so much trouble now. I, I look, I'm glad to hear that because his skill and, it, and everybody, you know, it doesn't matter much to me, but I know people love flair in the goal celebration. So that little pirouette that he did, particularly when he was doing it for your country and for Parma, he really was a hot ticket. And also, I think he was a guy who, even at his most, um, even at his elite level of football, was slightly differently shaped because he was small and he was like slightly built like a barrel. Yet his explosive movement in space and his ability to do things that you, you didn't expect marked him out as special, I think. Yeah, it did. It did. And... Uh... I mean, even in, in back in those times, he, he, how should I put it in a nice way, he didn't look like an elite sportsman. Yeah, is that a good way to put it? But uh, for Sweden, every time he played, he played fantastic. Yeah, it was a short career. It, by the way, it was the best play in the, in the World Cup '90 for Sweden as well when he, when he broke through. So he's played. Three tournaments for Sweden, being the best player in each of the tournaments. So that, that, that's why his uh, big status in Sweden, I think. Does your love affair with Spain begin later that year in the Olympics? And I know you said you didn't have time to savor the buzz when Sweden hosted it. But, Jockey, going to an Olympics, man, that, that's, that's pretty special. It is, but it's probably more special if you're competing in any other sport than, than football, I'd say. Because in football, it's, well, for a European, it's the third biggest tournament, isn't it? I mean, the World Cup, you have the Euros and they have the Olympics. Uh, but, you know, uh, obviously, really nice uh, thing to do. And especially, we talked about the way we got there. Uh, Sweden hasn't been to that many Olympics either and it was a good thing and then we were lucky enough to, to have it in Barcelona which is 
pretty good place to be as well, isn't it? And, and I'm asking because when I went to, as a fan to the World Cup in 82, I was immediately struck by heat, smells, the way that the crowd celebrated a near chance, which was, and you all, you know this now because you lived and worked in Spain for many years, but the coffee, the, the coffee maker noises, the, the, the football papers every day, even though at that stage maybe you couldn't read Spanish. But don't you get any kind of special feel from Spain when you're there uh, with the national team to the Olympics? Certainly that's what impacted me. For sure, for sure. Uh, Spain in general, that was a really good experience. But the Olympics per se, I mean, you know it's not the biggest tournament in football. And we just, like a month before, played the Euros. Uh, and then, uh, to make it all worse, we lost against Australia in the quarterfinals. And we thought we, thought we had a good chance of, I'm not saying winning it, because I don't think we would have ever beaten Spain uh, in the final, for sure. But we thought we had a good chance. We had a good team. We competed well. And then we passed the group stages and got Australia in the quarterfinal. That, that's a good draw. And it did any day of the week, right? That's a good draw. And we lost. Uh, so that makes uh, it sours the experience a little bit, the football inside. Everything else, perfect, fantastic. I hear you because they go on to get beaten 6 1 by Poland in the semi final. And you think about that and you think yeah. Australia were to be beaten. I get you. Yeah. I, I think it's important to me. Um, to, to move forward to, to USA because you've already dodged me quite nicely about atmosphere surrounding tournaments. And yeah. I kind of knew, I knew also the way that you're built and, and that you weren't necessarily going to be like, ah, oh, yeah, off the pitch, this, that, and that thing. But when you go away for four or five weeks to the States, to what everybody now likes to call the OJ Simpson World Cup, yeah. um, I was there as a fan with my wife and my brother, just nicking about on like an interrail. Uh, you can get now with trains, you could get then with planes. You paid $300 and you had a month's free air travel if you went standby, which now, of course, you know, with security concerns, everybody thinks, everybody thinks I've made it up, but I haven't. Um, again, before the matches and before the fact that you, you have Sweden's second greatest performance in the World Cup ever. Um, what, 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 was the, what, was, what was this experience of going together as a group to the States like, above and beyond the matches? Being in the States, I mean, you've been obviously for a long time. It's, it's a fantastic place to visit. And we, or at least I, hadn't been there a lot before. We went on a pre-season, like a pre World Cup tour to to Miami, and then we play, we played two games in Miami, like uh, in January that year, January February, and then a game in Mexico. And that that was my whole experience of the of the states. And our generation, we all grown up with American culture, aren't we? And uh, then we get drawn in the group. Who's going to play the first game in the, in LA, which was. Pretty nice. We had a couple of weeks in San Diego before the World Cup started. Uh, and amazing experience. And then we got to travel a bit. We played a game in Los Angeles to Detroit, which at the time uh, wasn't very nice. Detroit. Uh, Dangerous. Don't go, don't go downtown Detroit in 94. Now I'm sure they clean it up. Uh, but back then, uh, they told us, don't go into downtown Detroit. We stayed in Pontiac where, where the stadium was uh, and everybody said, downtown Detroit, prohibited, don't go in there, right? I had my wife uh, just across the border in Windsor in Canada, so I had to go through, or had to. I did a couple of times, but uh, it was like a war zone back then. And then we played a game in Dallas in... 45 degrees heat at 12 noon and then what was next? San Francisco. San Francisco and then back to LA for another couple of games. Fantastic experience. 
big crowds uh, who knew nothing about football, to be honest. But I think we averaged on our seven games in the World Cup close to 80,000 per game. But back then, they didn't have a clue about uh, football or soccer or whatever, whatever you want to call it. But stadiums were great, uh, crowds were big, and the life in the States as a 23-year-old was, was good. Good experience. And then, footballing-wise, it's pretty decent as well. as well. What did they allow you to do? Because I, I, I've been lucky enough to be TV producer with Spain on three tournament wins. And I've noticed that certainly for uh, Luis Aragonés and Del Bosque, there was a really good mix of double training sessions, which weren't about fitness, they were about ball work, about the players were desperate to get on the ball. So there was a second session, there was some tactics, there was lots of mini matches, fine, all that. But both of them allowed a little bit of social time, proper social time, which as journalists for clubs now, we're used to not really getting near and uh, superstars and nightclubs and, and private jets and all that shit. But with Spain, it wasn't. They, they, they just went out and, and under Del Bosque, they, he told them, you beat Portugal, you're going out big. Lads, my only rule is make the plane the next day back to the base camp. That's it. Uh, what were the rules for you there? No, but we had uh, pretty similar rules. I mean, if you're uh, competing with a national team, you're going to behave more or less right uh, anyway. You're not going to do anything that damages your opportunity to win the next game. But we had pretty lax rules. We had a big uh, responsibility on the players to take care of themselves. And uh, in between the training sessions, we, I don't think we trained twice once over the World Cup, because you're there to compete, you need to be fresh for the games. We had pretty lax rules, we went out and about and uh, had a look over uh, every town and I'm not saying every bar because we didn't, but you know, to grab a beer every now and again together, I think uh, in those days that's, that's nothing, uh, that's nothing uh, unsurprising. Uh, you know, that's the way it was. And it's about, if you stay together for six weeks, you can't be locked in with a team for six weeks. Then, then it's impossible to, inform, to perform. I mean, uh, uh, he left a lot of responsibility to the players. And I think we responded to it. We had a good time. We had a really good time. In training, not in matches, what, what were you beginning to think about this, this little dreadlock kid who played for Feyenoord? Because I guess you can't have had a massive exposure to Henke Larson uh, prior to that. And certainly this would be regarded as his breakthrough tournament. In private, yeah, in training, what were you beginning to think of him? I played him a few times in, in the Swedish league before we went there. And uh, he's the same age as me, but he broke through a little bit later than I in the national team in general, I think, but uh, then they lasted a lot longer than me as well. Uh, really good player who had a hard time uh, getting a starting place because we had two good players up front. We had uh, Martin Dallin and uh, Kenneth Anderson. Kenneth scored five goals and Martin four. Uh, hard to get in that team, but obviously you could see, you could see already that he was going to be a good player. But, but he, then again, he played for the dark side. <laughs> yeah, okay, we'll come to that. No, that's that's going to be registered immediately. But like, he, he was made to play in midfield at Feyenoord, which is one of the reasons he, he left. And, and I, I wondered if, if you were seeing identical movement from him in training sessions, because I think he, I don't think it's talked about a lot, but I think he was an immensely bright footballer who figured out a lot about the game and chose, when I saw him, chose a, a, a completely different attitude to how to play and behave at Celtic compared to Feyenoord. Then when he went to Barcelona, he had to relearn football. And I've watched him relearn it when, when Eto or Xavi wouldn't give him the balls when he was making a Celtic run. And he was used to saying, I've made that run, give it. And Celtic did because he just scored and won them things. And I believe that probably you were saying a Henrik Larsson in 94, and when you played it previously, who was quite different from the Henrik Larsson in, in the latter two-thirds of his career. Yeah, for sure. 
for sure. I think his uh, biggest uh, strength as a footballer was that he developed uh, into a thinking footballer. A thinking footballer who could adapt to to his environment, to adapt uh, against whoever he was playing, to the opponent. Uh, he wasn't he wasn't the quickest. He wasn't the most skillful. He didn't have the hardest shot, but he, he was one of the most clever footballers I've seen, at least from Sweden. Uh, uh, he was really good at that, and he kept evolving the older he got as well. And that's that's why, if you look at it now, his best years were probably his last years in football, because uh, he developed all the time. Really good player, but back then he was more as an out and out striker, I'd say. Out and out striker who wanted to get the, the ball deep in front of goals and, and score. But he developed into a really, really good footballer. Yeah, that's, that's the guy I saw, and, I, and you know 10,000 times better than me. I, I, I have always respected the fact that he's a, a calculator in terms of percentages, options development, what situation am I in, not on the pitch, in his clubs, what do I have to do, I adore that. If every footballer was born with that, then irrespective of his basic talents, he or she would be a better player if, if their brains were working as crisply as Henrik's does. That, that's certainly the guy I saw. And, and I, I think for the outside world jockey, in my opinion, he became iconic of that World Cup, not because of his overall performance, his, you know, some impact in the in the third fourth playoff, but his look was very startling, and I think people take that away from the World Cup. And it was only later that we began to understand him better. Yeah, and he kept on the same look for a while as well, didn't he? Yeah. And then, uh, I'm I'm saying I didn't play when with Henrik when he was at uh, his best in the national team. I played against him. For, for Celtic when he started to develop as a really, really uh, top European player. Uh, but at that time, he had to take a little bit of a backseat and I, I'm sure he learned from it and analyzed why and he became a better player. Again, I'm going to laugh at myself here because, um, and it's funny because when we were on television together, you laugh at me because I'm a romantic and the words are here, there, and I, and I know you're playing ball with me at the moment. You're giving a little bit more than you would normally do, which I respect. But I'm still going to ask the same question, which makes, which makes me happy. What kind of emotional experience was the Romania game? Because, you know, it's a fucking mental thing. Because the World Cup is in the States, it's a 12.30 kickoff. It's extra time and penalties. You're winning, then you're not, then you're losing. I know you were desperate to take a penalty, absolutely. I bet you were absolutely disgusted that you were taken off just before the end. And eventually, tell a story from the Jockey Bjorkman point of view. Because that game, if you look at it, that's the kind of game that the World Cup, that's why the World Cup is, is loved and cherished and lusted after. Yeah, to talk in the cliches, it's, it's a roller coaster, isn't it? Uh, we beat. Saudi Arabia, like a few days before, in in even bigger Dallas. heat, yeah, in Dallas, uh, which is a nice draw to get in, in the last 16th, isn't it? Uh, Saudi Arabia, and then by a miracle, we get Romania instead of Argentina, which was well. Obviously, we watched the game. I think that's one of the best games in in the World Cup. 94, when Romania beat uh, Argentina. We get Romania, we know we're on the roll, we know we, uh, we have a big chance of winning the game. Yet, uh, yet ahead, 1 0, great free kick. Best free kick. Uh, I wasn't involved, but I was on the pitch. Obviously, I wasn't involved. I was staying back at the halfway line, right? <laughs> but I was on the pitch at least. Great free kick, score 1 0. Uh, and it's, I can't even remember when, when they scored the equaliser. Uh, 88 I, minutes. 88 yeah, I, minutes. I think I got subbed because I had a problem with my groins in like the 80th minute or whatever. Another 10 minutes to keep them away from a goal. They score, start the extra time. 
Stefan Schwartz gets sent off. They score 2-1 and you think it's over. You think it's over and uh, you're disappointed, but you've been away for five weeks, so you see like you see a little bit of a silver lining. Uh, at least I'm gonna go back to my to my family at home. I'll see my family again, which I haven't seen for for a while, right? Because you want to put a positive spin on it. And then uh, Kenneth equalizes on a great header, fantastic header, and he gets the penalties. And uh, when the penalty started, I was pretty comfortable being subbed out, I must say. Though I would, I would have been... Well, would you have scored? 10th or 11th, I think, to take a penalty. <laughs> and it, it didn't go that deep. It didn't go that far. But how much, how much faith? Because if I'm not wrong, the keeper who's out there for Sweden that day is your teammate. Or yeah, yeah he's, he's, you're already at Gothenburg. It's it's Ravelli. So you know him. You, you you maybe in training even for fun you've taken penalties against him. Certainly you'll have watched him in training. But what what were your what was your thought process as Romania come up against him because he does well? Before it started, I, I thought we were going to win. Because he, he, he was a really good goal, goalkeeper. He's most famous for his crazy antics in the World Cup 94. But he was a great goalkeeper. Uh, I watched him growing up because he played with my dad as well for quite a few years before I played with him. Uh, really good goalkeeper. Good on penalties. I thought before it started, we're going to win this. And then we go and miss the first penalty. Håkan uh, Mill. Missed the first penalty, and then you know it's uphill from there. Uh, but you know how it is. It's uh, it's a roller coaster. Uh, one one second you think, then he saves one, and it goes into extra penalties. We score the first one. You're in with the chance. They score again, etc. Uh, it was a nice ending to it, though. I must say. Well done to the eccentric. What was the eccentricity of, of Ravelli? What was was that just because goalkeepers? Because whenever you hear him interview, he's a kind of straight, kind of serious guy, and it kind of looks like a bank manager or an accountant. No, 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 no. He's, he's a crazy guy. Tell... <laughs> no, no, plain and simple, he's a crazy guy. That's what it is. The appearance outside the pitch is a knowledgeable, uh, good guy in all. Uh, in all the senses of the word, but he's a crazy guy. On the pitch, he's always been a crazy guy, uh, a clown, what have you. He's been eccentric from when he started. Uh, tell, tell me how, tell me you how. Could, you couldn't speak with him. In the games, you couldn't speak with him. He's unreachable. Unreachable, he's never made a mistake in his life. <laughs> he's one of those, he's one of those guys. But that's probably a good thing yeah, when it comes to penalty shootout. And he was, uh, he got a little bit of vindication as well in the World Cup 94. He played for Sweden for, I don't know, 15 years probably before. Since at least, yeah, uh, I think he made his debut like 80 or something. And I played with him in Gothenburg. He had a rough season up until the World Cup started. Shaky performance, uh, first couple of games, and then they all clicked. And uh, uh, he's still touring Sweden, doing speeches about saving, saving penalties in '94. <laughs> he's made the most Quite of right. it. Quite right. No, no, he's Quite made right. the most of it. He's made the most what, of it. What could you hear behind you? Was he a shouter? All the time. All the time. Shouting all the time. But I'd say everybody's played with him more than 10 games, they've ignored it. <laughs> Maybe the first couple of games you listen and then you know it's only bullshit coming out. You, you, lift, you push the ignore button and that's it, more or less. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know there was an ignore button. I think people do that when they oh, were me also. That's the center off, you have to have it. I'm telling you. It's beautiful. You make him. It's it's Thomas. Thomas sounds like a future big interview guest. And and this is where things are unfair. I mean, you're you're not a guy who complains an awful lot. But you come out of that test, the 120 minutes, the heat. You know, you, you're a northern European team. I know there's sunshine in Sweden in the summer, but fuck's sake. And and you're asked to how many days? Three days later. Three three days. 
Yeah. I mean, you're a coach now. What do you make it say about the the recuperation time for athletes to, you know, three days is is your is your bare absolute fucking minimum, right? Three days is uh, it's the minimum, but it's all right if the other team has uh, three days as well. They had five days. They had five days. We had three days. Uh, and I still don't understand why we played a team that we already met in the group stages in the semi-finals. That should have been a final. Saying that, looking back on the semi-final, I wouldn't play it again. We lost 1-0 and that's a very, very flattering result for us. It could have been 5 or 6. Could have been 5 or 6. They, they were the better team. We can talk about preparation all of that. They would have beaten us uh, 9 times out of 10 anyway. But they had a slight advantage in, in the preparation. Yes. Then, then, okay, a clue for people listening in, um, before we go to our sponsor's question, you're up against Romario that day, he makes the difference in a team that was, they, they were, if you look at their 11, irrespective of the final and how it was pretty boring, their 11, their 15, their 16, it is, is fucking exceptional. So your point's well made. But we're gonna come to, your revenge over Romario, which happened. But how, how jockey, from the inside, how do you snap on again with the tiredness, with the dehydration, and win a third, fourth place playoff? Where some guys, I don't know any of your colleagues, apart from once I've insulted Patrick, some guys might have been thinking out loud exactly what you said, it's time to go home. Third, fourth, who gives a fuck? And you go out there and you, you smack Romania around. How? Bulgaria. Bulgaria. No. Uh, Bulgaria, pardon me. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Bulgaria. No, uh, first and foremost, it would have been uh, a shame to finish uh, a good tournament with uh, two losses. So the motivation was definitely there. And for, for a small country like Sweden to motivate yourself for a third place game, I think it's probably a lot easier than, than if it's France, England, Italy, Germany, or what have you. Uh, that's a given. That's a given because we're a small country, it's our opportunity. And then the rumor said it uh, that the Bulgarians had a pretty big party after the semi, uh, semi final against Italy as well, so that probably helped. They were known for a little bit of that, yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but shame on them then. I don't, They've I, been I don't so exciting. I don't feel no, so. No, 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 no. No, I wouldn't ask you to be. I, I love the way that they dealt with Jeremy in that tournament. Everybody loves a German knockout. Everybody loves Lechkov, man. Everybody loves a diving header. That was such a game. But the right side won the. Did, did you get a medal for third? Yeah, what we did. did you get for third? We, we got a medal. Bronze medal, I think. I think the bulgarians got the same medal though so it wouldn't have made a difference uh, it looked the same at least yeah 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 because uh, we had a medal ceremony after the game and i'm pretty sure their medal looked the same as us but i mean in the end in the books we came third they came fourth uh, and i don't have a clue where the medal is anyway so you really don't no i don't i think it's hopefully some somewhere in stockholm or otherwise it's left in my head. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave the word hopefully just lying there. We, we've got sponsors who keep us alive. Thank you, Bet365. Um, this is a, a basic question, but it's interesting. Because throughout your career, you've played alongside footballers like Brian Laudrup, uh, Gaza, Henrik, Jonas Turn, uh, Luis Miller for a while, but also Mendieta, Angelo. Uh, we could go on listing because you've been good enough to play alongside special footballers. If I if I did, if I avoided the word best and said to you, who's the greatest player that you had the privilege of playing with? Who would you name? That's a tough one. You mentioned some really good names. Uh, some really good names. These are these questions you have to ask in, uh, in advance before we start uh, the bloody podcast, right? So you get a few few minutes to prepare. I'd say for me, it's uh, I'd say the best. I wouldn't say the greatest. The best footballers outright are either Brian Ladrup or Paul Gascoigne. 
as footballers, for sure. Uh, Mendieta, close to it, probably in the end achieved as much as these other guys, but I think as outright footballers, skillfully, perception, all of that, that that's the two best uh, footballers I've played with. It's a good answer, but draw, drawn out on, on ability to beat a man, special technique, or, or just the thing that makes your heart go jump when they, when they pull off a trick or a skill. What are the things that guided you towards them? No, but they, they were good at everything, I'd say. And Brian obviously had a very offensive position, playing for Rangers. He could do a little bit whatever he wanted to, uh, but he did. He did every game. Every game, scored a lot of goals, a lot of assists, beat his guy every time he wanted to. Uh, I'm not sure it was the right competition for him to play in. I, I think he should have been somewhere else because he, uh, he could have played anywhere else in the world and be world beater for sure. I think playing in Rangers in Scotland was probably a little bit too easy for him. Gaza. A little bit the same, but then you get the other side as well, the tackling, the ball winning, distribution. Uh, I think the first year I played with Gaza, it's, it's hard to beat. He scored 20 odd goals and must have had 20, 30 assists as well. Performed every game, uh, even though we had the lifestyle he had. Well, I was going to say, it wouldn't Paul have been a much greater figure in football if he hadn't been so dull. Yeah, probably, probably, probably. That's the word you. That's the word. How does he? Uh, okay. How does he measure? Exactly. How does he measure on the Ravelli scale? Yeah. In a different sense, as crazy, crazy as a bat as well uh, as Ravelli, but but in another sense, Gas is probably the the kindest player I've ever played with. Uh, Biggest heart, uh, wanted everybody to feel good, and I think that's uh, that's a little bit what became his downfall as well. Uh, wanted everybody else to be happy around him, and uh, should have taken better care of himself. But uh, entertainer on and off the pitch, uh, but a generally good guy, and that's uh, that's what those two things. When people talk about Gasser nowadays, are oh, easily forgotten. I mean, some people, you, you are my age, we remember the good footballer, for sure, the great footballer. Uh, a few people got close to him enough to know he's a really, really good lad. But most people remember the antics, the, the clown. And it's a shame. It's a shame because, as I said, probably one of the best players I ever played with. Fantastic play. Could do whatever you want with wanted with a football ball. This is a point, Jockey, because I, I know you relatively well to know that you're like the guy you're describing, um, big heart, good person. This is the moment in the podcast, just to take a second to be serious and say this is the week when Brian was able to announce that for the first time in ten years he's cancer free. Yeah. So and this is the week this is the week when uh, one of Paul's, one of Gaza's ex schoolmates um, who happens to be black said that he and his sister were protected from bullies in this school in uh, just in, in Newcastle um, by a young Gaza who was younger than the bullies but stepped in to say don't touch them and, and the guy who's now I think famous creative uh, writer and commentator was saying Gaza was one of the few who didn't see colour just saw an injustice and wanted to step in and put it right immediately and I think your words, I'd like to compliment your words by saying that, you know, the Loudrop family in general are class people. Both of the brothers, the dad I never saw, fantastic footballers. And Gaza's, Gaza's ability to, to, to try to look after other people, think of other people, as well as being hysterically funny and a genius footballer, it makes, him, it, it makes it brutally sad that it, it, he's had such difficult times um, finding balance in his life. So I'm glad you chose them, would be what I would say. Um, Every day of the week. Yeah, I would. I hear it. And he, we, uh, I wouldn't say yes, but he was a good friend of mine. We haven't had 
contact since I played for for Sunderland. That, that's the last time I saw him, uh, and that's quite a while ago, as you know. But uh, he was a great, a great friend of mine. I spent a lot of evenings uh, with me and my wife as well. Laughing. Laughing, laughing, a little bit of crying every now and again as well, but... Uh, yeah, he's an emotional as I guy. Said, as I said, generally a good guy. Um, I'll let you pick now, because again, um, I'm going to draw you into the, the emotional, romantic side of the Champions League. I love the fact that um, you can claim that you've played twice against Romario in the Champions League, and he never scored against you. And you won home and away against PSV Eindhoven. Yeah, he must have played in. Didn't he play for Barcelona as well? Was it there then? We're going we're to we're come to Spain yeah, in a minute, yeah. baby. I, I'm, yeah. I'm carving each one out on the bedpost. Yeah, good, Jockey good. was here. Jockey yeah. was here. Yeah, uh, no, that's a good one. That's the first time. Uh, that's the first Champions League ever played, isn't it? Or is it the second one? Can't remember. First, it's too first, long. First, first, first one, I think. Yeah. We got drawn into a group with the PSV, Milan, and AC Milan, and uh, Porto. Uh, had a couple of great wins against PSV, who at the time were a really good side with uh, Romario playing up front. Peter just, a, just a year, uh, uh, around, maybe a year before, a year after the World Cup. But the thing that I, I like is that Romario was such a...